encourage each of you to directly engage with each other on the issues. So let's get to our first question. Since the last time you all shared the stage, Senator Sanders, a self-described Democratic Socialist, has surged into the lead nationally in the Democratic race. And there's a new person on the stage tonight, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, a former Republican who spent millions of his own dollars to run in this race. What hasn't changed, a majority of Democratic voters still say their top priority is beating President Trump. So Senator Sanders, Sanders, the first question to you. Mayor Bloomberg is pitching himself as a centrist who says he's best positioned to win in November. Why is your revolution a better bet? In order to beat Donald Trump, we're going to need the largest voter turnout in the history of the United States. Uh, Mr. Bloomberg had policies in New York City of stop and frisk, which went after African-American and Latino people in an outrageous way. That is not a way you're going to grow voter turnout. What our movement is about is bringing working class people together black and white and Latino, Native American, Asian American, around an agenda that works for all of us and not just the billionaire class. And that agenda says that maybe, just maybe, we should join the rest of the industrialized world, guarantee health care to all people as a human right, raise that minimum wage to a living wage of 15 bucks an hour, and have the guts to take on the fossil fuel industry because their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet and the need to combat climate change. Those are some of the reasons we have the strongest campaign to defeat Donald Trump. So, so Mayor, like Mayor Bloomberg, uh, uh, can, can Senator Sanders beat President Trump and how do you want to respond to what else he said? Um, I don't think there's any chance of uh, the senator beating President Trump. You don't start out by saying, uh, I've got 160 million people, I'm going to take away the insurance plan that they love. That's just not a ways that you go and start building the coalition that the Sanders uh, camp thinks that they can do. I don't think there's any chance whatsoever. And if he goes and is the candidate, we will have Donald Trump for another four years and we can't stand that. So I'd, I'd like to talk about who we're running against. A billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. Democrats are not going to win if we have a nominee who has a history of hiding his tax returns, of harassing women, and of supporting racist policies like redlining and stop and frisk. Look, I'll support whoever the Democratic nominee is, but understand this. Democrats take a huge risk if we just substitute one arrogant billionaire for another. This country has worked for the rich for a long time and left everyone else in the dirt. It is time to have a president who will be on the side of working families and be willing to get out there and fight for them. That is why I am in this race and that is how I will beat Donald Trump. Senator, we got a Senator leader Klobuchar. Senator Senator Klobuchar, what do you think the path is from this stage to the White House? What works? I think the path is a high voter turnout. I'm the one on this stage that had the highest voter turnout of any state in the country when I led the tip ticket, as well as bringing in rural and suburban voters. And I've done that as well. And I'm the only one with the receipts to have done that in Republican congressional districts over and over again. But I want to say this. I actually welcomed Mayor Bloomberg to the stage. I thought that he shouldn't be hiding behind his TV ads. And so I was all ready for this big day. And then I looked at the memo from his campaign staff this morning. And it said that he actually thought that three of us uh, should get out of the way. That is what his campaign said, because we should pave the way uh, for him to become the nominee. Uh, you know, I have been told as a woman, as someone that maybe no one thought was still going to be standing up on this stage, but I am because of pure, pure grit and because of the people out there, I've been told many times to wait my turn and to step aside. And I'm not going to do that now, and I'm not going to do that because a campaign memo uh, from Mayor Bloomberg said this morning uh, that the only way uh, that we get a nominee is if we step aside for him. I think we need something different than Donald Trump. I don't think you look at Donald Trump and say, we need someone richer in the White House. Thank you. Mayor Bloomberg, there's a lot for you to respond to there, so here's your opportunity. 
Um, I think we have two questions to face tonight. One is, who can beat Donald Trump? And number two, who can do the job if they get into the White House? And I would argue that I am the candidate that can do exactly both of those things. I'm a New Yorker. I know how to take on an arrogant con man like Donald Trump that comes from New York. I'm a mayor, or was a mayor. I know how to run a complicated city, the biggest, most diverse city in this country. I'm a manager. I knew what to do after 9-11 and brought the city back stronger than ever. And I'm a philanthropist who didn't inherit his money, but made his money. And I'm spending that money to get rid of Donald Trump, the worst president we have ever had. And if I can get that done, it will be a great contribution to America and to my kids. Vice President Biden, let you weigh in here. In terms of who can beat Donald Trump, NBC did a poll yesterday. It says Joe Biden is best equipped to beat Donald Trump. That's what your poll said. And it said that I can beat him in, the, in those toss-up states, too, those states we have to win. I'm ahead by eight points across the board. So in terms of being able to beat Donald Trump, I'm better positioned, according to your poll, than anybody else to beat Donald Trump, number one. Number two, the mayor makes an interesting point. The mayor says that he has a great record, that he's done these wonderful things. Well, the fact, of the, fact, the fact of the matter is he has not managed his city very, very well when he was there. He didn't get a whole lot done. He had stop and frisk, throwing up close to five million young black men up against the wall. And when we came along in our administration, the President Obama, and said we're going to send in a moderator to a mediator to stop it, he said that's unnecessary. So I, we we're going to get a chance to talk about the mayor's record. But in terms of who is best prepared to beat Donald Trump, look at your poll and what it says. Mayor Buttigieg, you'd like to weigh in. Yes, we've got to wake up as a party. We could wake up two weeks from today, the day after Super Tuesday, and the only candidates left standing will be Bernie Sanders and Mike Bloomberg, the two most polarizing figures on this stage. And most Americans don't see where they fit if they've got to choose between a socialist who thinks that capitalism is the root of all evil and a billionaire who thinks that money ought to be the, the root of all power. Let's put forward somebody who actually lives and works in a middle class neighborhood in an industrial Midwestern city. Let's put forward somebody who's actually a Democrat. Look. <laughs> shouldn't have to choose between one candidate who wants to burn this party down and another candidate who wants to buy this party out. Look, we can do better. Senator, Senator think, Sanders, you know, are you polarizing? If speaking to the needs and the pain of a long neglected working class is polarizing, I think you got the wrong word. What we are trying finally to do is to give a voice to people who after 45 years of work are not making a nickel more than they did 45 years ago. We are giving a voice to people who are saying we are sick and tired of billionaires like Mr. Bloomberg seeing huge expansions of their wealth while a half a million people sleep out on the street tonight. And that's so what we are saying, Pete, is maybe it's a time for the working class of this country to have a little bit of power in Washington rather than your billionaire campaign contrib contributors. Hey, uh, all right, look, first of all, I know. Okay, look, my campaign, campaign is fueled by hundreds of thousands of contributors, including 46 billionaires among the hundreds of thousands of contributors. And look, We've got to unite this country to deal with these issues. You're not the only one who cares about the working class. Most Americans believe we need to empower workers. As a matter of fact, you're the one who is at war with the culinary union right here in Las Vegas. We, we are more union support than you have ever dreamed of. We, can we have the support of unions all across this yeah, country. Yeah, but division I'm putting forward has the support of the American people. Really? We can actually deliver health care without taking it away from anyone. We can actually empower workers and lift wages without further polarizing this country. And we can build a movement without having legions of our supporters online and in person. Look, right, I, think, you, uh, I think it is Democratic important figures, to be Senator, leaders alike. Senator Warren, I have a question for you. 
On Sunday on Meet the Press, Vice President Biden accused Senator Sanders supporters of bullying union leaders here with, quote, vicious, malicious, misogynistic things. You said Democrats cannot build an inclusive party on a foundation of hate. Are Senator Sanders and his supporters making it harder for Democrats to unify in November? Look, I have said many times before, we are all responsible for our supporters and we need to step up. That's what leadership is all about. But the way we are going to lead this country and beat Donald Trump <laughs> is going to be with a candidate who has rock solid values and who actually gets something done. When Mayor Bloomberg was busy blaming African Americans and Latinos for the housing crash of 2008, I was right here in Las Vegas, literally just a few blocks down the street holding hearings on the banks that were taking away homes from millions of families. That's when I met Mr. Estrada, one of your neighbors. He came in to testify and he said he thought he'd done everything right with Wells Fargo. But what had happened, they took away his house in a matter of weeks. This man stood there and cried while he talked about what it was like to tell his two little daughters that they might not be in their elementary school, that they might be living out of their van. I spent the next years making sure that would never happen again. Wall Street fought us every inch of the way on a consumer agency. They lost and I won. We need a candidate with unshakable values and a candidate who can actually get something done for working thank people. You, Senator. That's why I'm in this Senator, race and that's how you. I'll beat Donald Trump. Senator Sanders. We have over 10.6 million people on Twitter and 99.9% .9 of them are decent human beings, are working people, are people who believe in justice, compassion, and love. And if there are a few people who make ugly remarks, who attack trade union leaders, I disown those people. They are not part of our movement. But let me also say what I hope my friends up here will agree with is that if you look at the wild west of the internet, talk to some of the African-American women on my campaign, talk to Senator Nina Turner, talk to others and find the vicious, racist, sexist attacks that are coming their way as well. So I would hope that all of us understand that we should do everything we possibly can to end the viciousness and ugliness on the internet. Our campaign is about issues. It's about fighting for the working families and the middle class. It is not about vicious attacks on other people. Senator, when, Senator, when you say that you. you disown these attacks and you didn't personally direct them, I believe you. Well, thank but, you. It is, but at a certain point, you got to ask yourself, why did this pattern arise? Why is it especially the case among your supporters? I don't think it is especially the case, by That's the way. just not true. Look, well, people know. No, Pete, if you want to talk to some of the women people. on my campaign, what you will see is the most ugly, sexist, racist attacks that are, I won't even describe them here, they're so disgusting. And let me say something else about this, not being too paranoid. All of us remember 2016. And what we meant, what we remember is efforts by Russians and others to try to interfere in our election and divide us up. I'm not saying that's happening, but it would not shock me. I saw some of those tweets regarding the Culinary Workers Union. I am the have a 30-year, 100% pro-union voting record. Do you think I would support or anybody supports me would be attacking union leaders? It's not thinkable. But yeah, leadership okay. is about what you draw out of people. It's, what, uh, it's about how you inspire people to act. And right now, we're in, this, we're in this toxic political environment. Leadership isn't just about policy. I think, at least in broad terms, we're largely pulling in the same direction on policy. But leadership is also about how you motivate people to treat other people. I think you have to accept some responsibility and ask yourself what it is about your campaign in, the partic in particular that seems to be motivating this behavior more than others. Because well, in order to I, turn I, the page on the Trump era, we're gonna need a president, a, not just a candidate who can win, but a president I have an idea of how can we can stop sexism on the internet. We could nominate a woman 
for candidates uh, for President of the United States. I think that might go a long way if we showed our stuff as a party. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is really what is at the core of this issue between Senator Sanders and the Culinary Union. And that is this. These are hardworking people, housekeepers like Elizabeth and I met with last night, uh, who have health care plans that have been negotiated over time, sweat and blood. And that is the truth for so many Americans right Senator, now. Thank you. There are 149 million Americans that would lose their current health well, insurance Klobuchar, under Senator, Senator Sanders' bill. Senator, That's what you. it says on page 8. And I don't think we should forget that. On that note, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Chuck Dunn. Senator Sanders, I'm going to stay on this topic, um, uh, on the culinary, uh, on this issue with the Culinary Union. Uh, obviously, they're their leaders are warning their members about that your health care plan will take away their health care plan, take away private insurance completely. There are some Democrats who like you a lot, but worry that this plan, Medicare for All, is going to take away private insurance and that it goes too far. Are they right? No. Let me be very clear. Two points. For a hundred years, from Teddy Roosevelt to Barack Obama, this country has been talking about the need to guarantee health care for all people. And yet today, despite spending twice as much per capita, Chuck, twice as much as any other major country on earth, we got 87 million who are uninsured or underinsured. We got over 60,000 people who die every year because they don't get to a doctor on time. We're getting ripped off outrageously by the greed and corruption of the pharmaceutical industry, which in some cases charges us 10 times more for the same drugs because of their price fixing. 500,000 people go bankrupt every year because they can't afford medical bills. So let me be very clear to my good friends in the Culinary Workers Union, a great union. I will never sign a bill that will reduce the health care benefits they have. We will only expand it for them, for every union in America, and for the working class of this country. Senator Warren, you, you were all in on Medicare for All, and then you have since came up with a transition plan. Is it because of the impact on unions? So I want to be clear. I've been to the culinary unions, health care facilities. They're terrific. You don't want to shut them down. You want to expand right. them. You want to see them all across Nevada and all across this country. Right. But we need to get everybody's health care plan out here. Uh, Mayor Buttigieg really has a slogan that was thought up by his consultants to paper over a thin version of a plan that would leave millions of people unable to afford their health care. It's not a plan, it's a PowerPoint. And Amy's plan is even less. It's like a post-it note, insert plan here. Bernie right. has started very much, uh, has a good start, but instead of expanding and bringing in more people to help, uh, instead, his campaign relentlessly attacks everyone who asks a question or tries to fill in details about how to actually well, make this work. And then his own advisors say, yeah, probably won't happen anyway. Look, health care is a crisis in this country. We need, my approach to this is we need as much help for as many people as quickly as possible and bring in as many supporters as we can. And if we don't get it all the first yep. time, take the win and come you. back into the fight to ask I for promise. more. Guys, I'm going to get everybody in. I got you. Mayor, 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 Mayor Buttigieg, I think she name checked you first. I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> you name check me second. Uh, yes, I, well, I, okay, I I'm, think Amy I'm more, said. I'm more of a Microsoft Word guy, and if you look at my plan, uh, I don't know if there are any PowerPoints on it, but you can definitely find the document on PeteForAmerica.com, and you'll see that it is a plan that solves the problem, makes sure there is no such thing as an uninsured American, and does it without kicking anybody off the plan that they have. This idea that the union members don't know what's good for them is the exact kind of condescension and arrogance that makes people skeptical of the policies we've been putting forward. Here we have a plan that the majority of Americans support. Do you realize how historic that is? That the American people are ready in a way far beyond what was true even 10 years ago and what was available to President Obama at the time. There's a powerful American majority ready to undertake the biggest 
biggest, most progressive reform we've had in healthcare in 50 years, just so long as we don't force it on anybody. So what is wrong okay. with that? All right, Senator Klobuchar, and then I'll have you explain. Okay. All right, Senator Klobuchar. Do that. Okay. Well, I, I think the post-it note came first, Senator. I don't know. I do think the post-it note came first. I must say I take personal offense since post-it notes were invented in my state. <laughs> Three M's. Three M. Okay. So my plan is a public option, and according to all the studies out there, it would reduce premiums uh, for 12 million people immediately. It would expand coverage for about that same number. It is a significant thing. It is what Barack Obama wanted to do from the very beginning. And the way I look at it, since we're in Vegas, when it comes to your plan, Elizabeth and Bernie's on Medicare for all, you don't put your money on a number that's not even on the wheel. And why is Medicare for all not on the wheel? Why is it not on the wheel? Because two thirds of the Democratic senators are not even on that bill. Because a bunch of the new House members that got elected see the problems with blowing up the Affordable Care Act. They see it right in front of them. And the truth is uh, that when you see some troubled waters, you don't blow up a bridge, you build one. And so we need right. to improve the Senator, Affordable Senator Care Act, me, not me, blow it up. Just, let me just, I, I will, will, it, it, you, you, you name check three of them. Let me get, let me get Senator also Sanders in there. Okay, you okay. Go ahead, Senator Sanders. <laughs> okay. We'll get you in, Miss. All right. Here we got a lot of people in here. That, we here got hit. It's my turn, yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. Somehow or another, Canada can provide universal health care to all their people at half the cost. UK can do it, France can do it, Germany can do it, all of Europe can do it. Gee whiz, somehow or another, we are the only major country on earth that can't do it. Why is that? And I'll tell you why. It's because last year the healthcare industry made a hundred billion dollars in profits. Pharmaceutical industry, top six companies, $69 billion in profit. And those CEOs are contributing to Pete's campaign oh. and other campaigns All up right. here. Let's clear this so up. So maybe, right maybe it, it is finally time that we said as a nation, enough is enough. The function of a rational health care system is not to make the pharmaceutical industry and the drug companies rich. It is to provide health care to all people as a human right, Mr. not a privilege. Mr. Vice President, no premiums, no copayments, no deductibles. Let's go ahead. And then Senator Warren. Mr. Vice Warren. President and Senator Warren. Hey, I'm the only one on this stage that actually got anything done on health care. Okay? I'm the guy the president turned to and said, go get the votes for Obamacare. And I noticed what everybody's talking about is the plan that I first introduced. That is to go and add to Obamacare, provide a public option, a Medicare-like option. It cost a lot and increase the subsidies. It cost a lot of money. It cost $750 billion over 10 years. But I pay for it by making sure that Mike and other people pay at the same tax rate their secretary pays at. That's how we get it paid, number one. Number two. You know, the, from the moment from the moment we passed that signature legislation, Mike called it a disgrace, number one. Number two, Trump decided to get rid of it. And number three, my friends here came up with another plan. But they don't tell you. When you ask Bernie how much it cost, the last time yeah. he said that, I think it was on your show, he said, we'll find out. We'll find out how or something to that effect. It cost over Senator 35 trillion Go bucks. Right. Let's get real. That's Senator right. Warren, you get the final word on this one and move to another question. Go ahead, Senator Warren. Go ahead, Senator Warren. So what, what I, I actually so I Hang actually on. took a look at the plans that are posted. Mayor Buttigieg, there are four expenses that families pay, right? Premiums, deductibles, co-pays, and uncovered medical expenses. Mayor Buttigieg says he will put a cap only on the premiums. And that Not means true. families are going to pick up the rest of the cost. Amy, I looked online at your plan. It's two paragraphs. Families are suffering and they need okay, a plan. It. You can't simply stand here and trash an idea to give health care coverage to everyone without having a realistic plan of your own. And if you're not going to own up to the fact either that you don't have a plan or that your plan is going to leave people without health care coverage, full coverage, then you need to yeah. say so. I just want yeah, to say on this, when I was in Reno, really yes. when I met a man who said he had diabetes, he gets his 
insulin yeah. through the through the VA, but his sister and his daughter also have diabetes. No way to pay for their insulin. Three human beings yeah. right here in Nevada My plan who takes are care struggling. Of that. They share okay. one insulin prescription. Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg. Of Obamacare at the beginning. Uh, yeah. Mr. Vice President, I just checked the record because you'd said one time that I was not. In 09, I testified and gave a speech before the mayor's uh, conference in Washington, uh, advocating it and trying to get all the mayors to sign on. And I think at that time I wrote an article praising Obamacare. It was either in the New York Post or the Daily News. So the facts are I was there. Let me finish. Today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I uh, was in favor of it. I thought it didn't do as, go as far as we should. What uh, Trump has done to this is a disgrace. The first thing we've got to do is get the White House and bring back those things that were left right. and then find a ways to expand it. Another public option to having some rules about capping okay. charges. All of those things. We shouldn't just walk right. away and start something that is totally new, untried. Okay, People Vice President Biden, go ahead. The, pre the, the mayor said when we passed it, the signature piece of this administration, it's a disgrace. They're the exact words. It was a disgrace. Look it up. Check it out. Okay. It was a disgrace. Thank and you. I okay. cover, by the way, that I plan. Right. You do not have surprise billing. You bring down drug prices. Right. People are not, and it gives people all the things we're just talking about. I guess you're not got the time to do it, but all I'll right. get a chance to talk Thank about you, it. Thank you, sir. Lester. All right, uh, Mayor, 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 Bloomberg, Mayor, Bloomberg, Mayor, Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg, at the beginning of this debate, we'll you took some back. incoming fire on this next topic, so let's get into it. In 2015, this is how you describe your policing policy as mayor. Quote, we put all the cops in the minority neighborhoods. And you explain that as, quote, because that's where all the crime is. You went on to say, and the way you should get the guns out of the kids' hands is to throw them against the wall and frisk them. You've apologized for that policy. But what does that kind of language say about how you view people of color or people in minority neighborhoods? Well, if I go back and look at my time in office, the one thing that I'm... Um, really worried about, embarrassed about, was how it turned out um, with stop and frisk. When I got into office, there were 650 murders a year in New York City. And I thought that my first responsibility was to give people the right to live. That's the basic right of everything. And we started, a, we adopted a policy which had been in place, uh, the policy that all big uh, police departments use of stop and frisk. What happened, however, was it got out of control. And when we discovered, I discovered that we were doing many, many, too many stop and frisks, we cut 95% of it out. And I've sat down with a bunch of uh, African-American clergy and business people to talk about this, to try to learn. I've talked to a number of kids who'd been stopped. And uh, I'm trying to, I was trying to understand how we change our policies so we can keep the city safe because the crime rate did go from 650, 50% down to 300. And we have to keep the lid on crime but we cannot go out and stop people right, Mayor, indiscriminately. Mayor, that thank you. Let me go to Vice happening. President Biden on this. You want to respond to that? Yes, to let's it? get something straight. The reason the stop and frisk change is because Barack Obama sent moderators to see what was going on. When we sent them there to say this practice has to stop, the mayor thought it was a terrible idea we send them there. A terrible idea. Let's get the facts straight. Let's get the order straight. And it's not whether he apologized or not. It's the policy. The policy was abhorrent. And it was, in fact, a violation of every right people have. And we are the one. My, our administration sent sent in people to monitor it. And, the, and at the very time, the, the, the mayor argued against that. This idea that he figured out it was a bad idea. He figured out it was a bad idea after we sent in monitors and said it must stop. Even then, he continued the policy. All right, uh, Mayor, would you like to make a quick response to that? Yes, I would. Um, I've sat, I've apologized, I've asked for forgiveness, but the bottom line is that we stopped too many people 
but the policy, we stop too many people, and we've got to make sure that we do something about criminal justice in this country. There is no great answer to a lot of these problems. And if we took off everybody that was wrong on this, off this panel, everybody that was wrong on criminal justice at some time in their careers, there'd be nobody else up here. And, uh, let's Senator be, Warren. Let's so be clear. I, I I'm sorry, who did you call on? Senator Warren. Warren. Sorry. I, I do think that this really is about leadership and accountability. When the mayor says that he apologized, listen very closely to the apology. The language he used is about stop and frisk. It's about how it turned out. Now, this isn't about how it turned out. This is about what it was designed to do to begin with. It targeted communities of color. It targeted black and brown men from the beginning. And if you want to issue a real apology, then the apology has to start with the intent of the plan as it was put together and the willful ignorance day by day by day of admitting what was happening even as people protested in your own street shutting out the sounds of people telling you how your own policy was All breaking right. their Senator, lives oh, you need a different apology Senator, here thank you uh, Chuck, can I, can I respond briefly? I mean, let me get senator klobuchar we're staying on this top we're going to stay on this topic but i want to get something in here with senator klobuchar when you were the top prosecutor in minneapolis senator there were at least two dozen instances where uh, police were involved in the deaths of civilians None of those officers were, uh, were prosecuted. You did prosecute a black teenager who was sentenced to life in prison, despite what are now serious doubts about the evidence. Now, the Minneapolis chapter of the NAACP has recently called for you to suspend your campaign over that case because some new evidence has come out since. Uh, big picture, why should black and Latino voters trust your judgment now if it appears you may have gotten it wrong then? First, I'll start with that case. Uh, it is very clear that any evidence, if there is new evidence, even old evidence, it should be reviewed by that office and by the county attorney. That must happen. I have called for that review. This was a case involving an 11-year-old African-American girl named Taisha Edwards who was shot doing her homework at her kitchen table. Three people were convicted. One of the cases is the one that is being uh, investigated, was investigated by a journalist, and I think it's very important but that that evidence come forward. In terms of the uh, police shootings that you uh, noted, mm -hmm. uh, those went to a grand jury, every single one of them. And I've made very clear uh, for months now uh, that like so many prosecutors, I think those cases, in my time, they were all going to the grand jury. It was thought that was the best way to handle them in many, you many jurisdictions. you think you should have spoke up? You didn't speak up at the Could time, I, should you? I actually did speak up on something very similar. And that was when our police chief in Minneapolis tried to take the investigations of police shootings into his own hands. And I strongly said I disagreed with that. Now I do believe also that a prosecutor should make those decisions herself. And the last thing I will say, because you asked the question about voting, I have the support of African Americans in my community in every election. I had strong support and strong support of leadership. And that's because I earned it. And this is going to be on me to earn it. You earn it with the what you stand for when it comes to equal opportunity. You earn it with the work that I have done, the leadership I've shown on voting rights. And yes, you earn it with the okay. work that must be done on criminal you, justice reform. Hallie Jackson. I want to talk about transparency here. <clears throat> because many Democrats, including most of you on stage, have criticized President Trump for his lack of transparency. But Senator Sanders, when you were here in Las Vegas in October, you were hospitalized with a heart attack. Afterwards, you pledged to make, quote, all your medical records public. You've released three letters from your doctors, but you now say you won't release anything more. What happened to your promise of full well, transparency? I well, I think we did. Let me tell you what happened. First of all, you're right. And thank you, Las Vegas, for the excellent medical care I got in the hospital two days. And I think the one area maybe the Mayor Bloomberg and I share, you have two stents as well. All right. 25 years ago. <laughs> well, we both have two stents. It's a procedure that is done about a million times a year. So we released the full report of that heart attack. Second of all, we released the full, my whole 29 years in the Capitol, the attending physician, all of my history, medical history. And furthermore, we released reports from two leading Vermont cardiologists who described my situation, and by the way, who said Bernie Sanders is more than able 
to deal with the stress and the vigor of being president of the United States. Hey, follow me around the campaign trail, three, four, five events a day. See how you're doing compared to me. <laughs> Mayor Buttigieg, you've been critical about transparency on this stage and people needing to do better. Is that response from Senator Sanders enough for you? No, it's not. Because uh, first of all, let me say, we're all delighted that you are in Thank fighting you. shape. And um, at the same time, transparency matters, especially living through the Trump era. Now, under President Obama, the standard was that the president would release full medical re records, do a physical, and release the readout. I think that's the standard that we should hold ourselves to as well. Now, President Trump lowered that standard. He said just a letter from a doctor is enough, and a lot of folks on this stage uh, are now saying that's enough. But I am certainly prepared to get a physical, put out the results. I think everybody here should be willing to do the same. But I'm actually less concerned about the lack of transparency on Sanders' uh, personal health than I am about the lack of transparency on how to pay for his health care plan, since he said that it's impossible to even know how much it's going to cost. And even after raising taxes on everybody making $29,000, there is still a multi-trillion dollar hole. Matter of fact, if you add up his policies all together, they come to $50 trillion. He's only explained $25 trillion worth of revenue, which means that the hole in there is bigger than the size of the entire economy of the United States. Mayor, the time you... has come to level with the American people on matters personal and on matters of Thank policy. Thank you, Senator Sanders, quickly. Okay. Let's level. Okay, let's level, Pete. Under your plan, which is a maintenance continuation of the status quo, That's the, sure. can I finish? The average American today is paying $12,000 a year. That's what that family is paying. 20% of a 60,000 income, $12,000 a year. Highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Just the other day, a major study came out from Yale epidemiologist in Lancet, one of the leading medical publications in the world. What they said, my friends, is Medicare for All will save $450 billion a year. Because we are eliminating the absurdity of thousands of separate plans that require hundreds of billions of dollars of administration. And by the way, ending the hundred billion a year in profiteering from the drug companies well, and the insurance companies. Really this Mayor, is this is really important. Mayor, this is really important. By the way, my plan is the status quo, costs. and that's false. Look, if my plan is the status quo, why was it attacked by the insurance industry the moment it came out? And on issue after issue after issue, this is what Senator Sanders is saying. If you're not with him, if you're not all the way on his side, then you must be for the status quo. Well, you well, know what? That is a picture that leaves most of the American people out. I want to go to Mayor I'm Bloomberg on this transparency the issue. Could I Very briefly on transparency, transparency Mayor then? Bloomberg, your campaign has said that you would eventually release your tax records yes. when it comes to transparency. But people are already voting now. Why should Democratic voters have to wait? It just takes us a long time. Unfortunately or fortunately... Oh, can I comment on that? Fortunately, I, I make a lot of money. And we do business all around the world, and we are preparing it. The, the, the number of pages will probably be thousands of pages. I can't go to TurboTax. But I put out my tax return every year for 12 years in City Hall. We will put out this one. It says, tells everybody everything they need to know about every investments that I make and where the money goes. And the biggest item is all the money I give away. And we list that, every single donation I make. And you can get that from our, from our foundation anytime you want. Okay, yeah, I'm just looking at my husband in the front row that has to like do our taxes all the time. Um, we probably could go to TurboTax. And the point of this is I believe in transparency. I had a Physical, by the way, it came out well. We might all be surprised if my blood pressure is lower than Mayor Pete's. That might really shock everyone out there. Um, and I think you should release your records uh, from your physical. Secondly, when it comes to tax returns, everyone up here has released their tax returns, Mayor. I think, and it is a major issue because the President of the United States has been hiding behind his tax returns, even when courts order them, him to come forward with those tax returns. And and I think, I don't care how much money anyone has. I think it's great you got a lot of money, but I think you've got to come forward with your tax returns. Senator, I want to get to you in a second. Mayor Bloomberg, quick response to Senator Klobuchar. We're releasing them. They'll be out in a few weeks, and uh, that's the, just as fast as I can do it. Remember, I only entered into this race 10 weeks ago. All of the, my associates here have been at this for a couple of years. 
And we did That's not. right. We so have. Engaging with voters. We're getting this. Let, let me ask you about something else, Mr. Mayor, because Mayor Bloomberg, let me ask you about something else. time and get it done. Senator Warren. I wish it were that simple. May, I'll let you get in here. But Mayor it Bloomberg. It would save me a lot of money. Let me ask you about something else. Several former employees have claimed that your company was a hostile workplace for women. When you were confronted about it, you admitted making sexually suggestive remarks, saying, quote, that's the way I grew up. In a lawsuit in the 1990s, according to the Washington Post, one former female employee alleged that you said, quote, I would do you in a second. Should Democrats expect better from their nominee? Let me, let me say a couple of things, and have, if I can have my full minute and a, qu a quarter, thank you. Um, I have no tolerance for the kind of behavior that the Me Too movement, movement has exposed. And anybody that does anything wrong in our company, we investigate it, and if it's appropriate, they're gone that day. But let me tell you what I do in my company and my foundation and in city government when I was there. In my foundation, the person that runs it's a woman, 70% of the people there are women. <clears throat> in my company, Lots and lots of women have big responsibilities. They get paid exactly the same as men. And in my um, uh, in City Hall, the person that's the top person, my deputy mayor, was a woman, and 40% of our commissioners were women. I am very proud of the fact that th about two weeks ago, we were awarded, uh, we were voted the uh, most f f the, the best place to work second best place in America. If that doesn't say something about our employees and how happy they are, I don't know what does. Senator Warren, you've been critical of Mayor Bloomberg on this issue. Yes, I have. And I hope you heard what his defense was. I've been nice to some women. That just doesn't cut it. The mayor has to stand on his record. And what we need to know is exactly what's lurking out there. He has gotten some number of women, dozens, who knows, to sign non-disclosure agreements, both for sexual harassment and for gender discrimination in the workplace. So, Mr. Mayor, are you willing to release all of those women from those non-disclosure agreements so we can hear their side of the story? We have a very few non-disclosure agreements. How, how many Let is that? Let me finish. How many is that? None of them accuse me of doing anything other than maybe they didn't like the joke I told. And let me just put, and let me put, there's a be, agreements between two parties that wanted to keep it quiet, and that's up to them. They signed those agreements, so, and we'll live with it. So wait, but, when you say it is up to, I just want to be clear. Some is how many? And, and, when you, and when you say they signed them and they wanted them, if they wish now to speak out and tell their side of the story about what it is they allege, that's now okay with you? You're releasing them on television tonight? Se Senator, no. Is that right? Senator, tonight? Senator, the company and somebody else, in this case, a man or a woman, or could be more than that, they decided when they made an agreement that they wanted to keep it quiet for everybody's no. interest. They signed the agreements, and that's what we're going to live with. I'm sorry. No, the question is, are I the women bound by being muzzled by you? And you could release them from that immediately, because understand, this is not just a question of the mayor's character. This is also a question about electability. We are not going to beat Donald Trump with a man who has who knows how many non-disclosure agreements and the drip, drip, drip of stories of women saying they have been harassed okay. and discriminated against. That's not what we do as Democrats. Mr. Vice President. Look, let's get something straight here. It's easy. All the mayor has to do is say, you are released from the non-disclosure agreement, period. We talk, about, we talk about transparency here. This guy got himself in trouble and maybe saying that he would, there was a non he couldn't disclose what he did. He went to his company. Just to be super clear, gotta, that was about the list of clients. No, so no, nobody no, gets no, yeah, the list. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. No, you're right. But he said, he went to the company and said, I want to be released. I want to be able to do it. Look, this is about transparency from the very beginning, whether it's your health record, whether it's your taxes, whether it's, whether you have cases against you, whether or not people have signed non-disclosure agreements. You think that women, in fact, were ready to say, I don't want anybody to know about what you did to me. 
That's not how it works. The way it works is they say, look, this is what you did to me. And the mayor comes along and his attorney say, I will give you this amount of money if you promise you'll never say anything. That's how it works. Mayor Bloomberg, final word to you. I said we're not going to get to end these agreements because they were made consensually and they have every right to expect that they will stay private. If they want to release it, they should be able to release Can themselves. I add, Can I add a word Say to this? yes. You know, we talk about electability and everybody up here wants to be Trump. And we talked about stop and frisk and we talked about the workplace that Mayor Bloomberg has established and the problems there. But maybe we should also ask how Mayor Bloomberg in 2004 supported George W. Bush for president put money into Republican candidates for the United States Senate when some of us, Joe and I and others, were fighting for Democrats to control the United States Senate. And maybe we can Iraq. talk, maybe we can talk about a billionaire saying that we should not raise the minimum wage or that we should cut Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. If that's a way to beat Donald Trump, Wow, I would be very surprised. Thank you, Senator. Vanessa, to you. Wait, wait. Honey. Senator Klobuchar, you're running on your Washington experience, but last week in a Telemundo interview, you could not name the president of Mexico or discuss any of his policies. Last night, you defended yourself saying, quote, this is in jeopardy. But my question to you is, shouldn't our next president know more about one of our largest trading partners? Of course, of course, and I don't think that that momentary, momentary forgetfulness actually reflects what I know about Mexico and how much I care about it. And I first want to say greetings to President Lopez Obrador. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, I, what I meant by the game of Jeopardy uh, is that I think we could all come up with things. You know, how many members are there in the uh, Israeli Knesset? 120. Who is the president um, of Klobuchar. Honduras? Hernandez. Senator but when Klobuchar. it comes to Mexico, I am the one person on this stage that came out first to say I was for the U.S-Mexican-Canadian trade agreement. That is going to be one of the number one duties of a president Senator is Klobuchar, to implement my that. colleague specifically asked you if you could name the president of yes. Mexico and your response was no. Yes, that's right. And I said that I made an error. Um, I think having a president that maybe is humble and is able to admit that here and there maybe wouldn't be a bad thing. Mayor but it was, if you could let me, good response. if you could, yeah, look, I, I would have likened this to trivia. I, I actually didn't know how many members were in the the Knesset, so well, you got there you me go. there. <laughs> but you're staking your candidacy on your Washington experience. You're on the committee that oversees border security. You're on the committee that does trade. You're literally in uh, part of the committee that's overseeing these things. And we're not able to speak to literally the first thing about the politics of the country you, to ourselves. Are you trying to say that I'm dumb or are you mocking me here, Pete? I'm I saying that you said shouldn't trivialize I made that an error. People sometimes forget names. I am the one that has, number one, has the experience based on passing over 100 Thank you, bills. Senator. If I could respond, this was a pretty big Thank allegation. You, He's basically saying that I don't have the experience to be president of the United States. I have passed over 100 bills as a lead Democrat since being in the U.S. Senate. I am the one, not you, that has won statewide in congressional district after congressional district. And I will say, when you tried in Indiana, Pete, to w run, what happened to you? You lost by over 20 points to someone who later lost to my friend Joe Donnelly. So don't tell me about experience. What unites us here is we want to win, right. and I think we should put a proven winner in charge of the ticket. This is a race for president. This is a race for president. If winning a race for Senate in Minnesota translated directly to becoming president, I would have grown up under the presidency of Walter Mondale. This is different. And the reason that I think we need to talk about Washington experience is uh, that we should ask what that experience has led to. Experience is, and certainly tenure is not always the same thing as judgment. We're going to talk about uh, votes okay, in the Senate in you know, Washington. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about it. Uh, let's talk about the major policy. Next question. Next question. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Thank you.
Thank you. I would, I would like Senator Warren and Mayor Bloomberg, uh, this question is for you. I want to talk about, and maybe this is appropriate here. Can I just defend Senator Klobuchar for a minute? This is not right. I understand that she forgot a name. It happens. It happens to everybody on this stage. Look, you want to ask about whether or not you understand trade policy with Mexico? Have at it. And if you get it wrong, man, you ought to be held accountable for that. You want to ask about the economy and you get it wrong, you ought to be held accountable. You want to ask about a thousand different issues and you get it wrong, you ought to be held accountable. But let's just be clear, missing a name all by itself does not indicate that you do not understand what's going on. And I just think this is a But Senator Klobuchar could not discuss Mexican policy. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. I am the only one Excuse who knows me. this man I, and met with him. I do have to respond. Oh, come, come on, on man. Uh, I called him really, up. You have just invoked my name again. And I ask you to look at the interview I did directly after the forum. Uh, which we went into great detail on Latin American policy. And I want to say one thing about Mayor Pete, where we just disagree. He was asked on a debate stage about the Mexican car cartels, uh, which are bad, bad criminal organizations. He said that he would be open to classifying them as terrorist organizations. I actually don't agree with that. That is a very valid debate to have. I don't think that would be good for our security coordination with Mexico. And I think you got that wrong. Well, I've at least spent that's more time in Mexico than anybody. Can I get a chance to say something? Oh, hold on. Nice see. See, thank you. See, see. Look, I'm the only one to spend extensive uh, hundreds of hours in Latin America. I've met with this president. I've met with the last president, the one before that. I've been deeply involved in making sure that we have a policy that makes more sense than this god-awful president we have now. I'm the guy that put together $750 million to provide help for those Latin American countries that are the reason why people are leaving, because there's nothing for them to stay for. I've spent hours and hours and hours, and so you want to talk about experience in Washington, it's good to know with whom you're talking, it's good to know what they think, it's good to know what you think, and it's good to be able to have a relationship. That's what it's about. All right. Well, we are clearly everybody's warmed up.